Okay, so this is level 2, exegesis. Alright, so yesterday we said that the Bible is like a giant jigsaw puzzle and so many events, so many places, so many people and sometimes we have a problem linking them and so people thought that uh, Elisha is the wife of Elijah <laughs> and that the epistle is the wife of the apostle. <laughs> and so again, my task here, as we've said yesterday, is just to provide you with the big picture. That's my task. Just provide you with the big picture. I'm not here to solve your puzzle. And uh, hopefully after this seminar, you can go home and then solve your puzzle and answer those questions through uh, the things that you've learned here. The first picture we showed you is the process wherein God wants us to uh, hear His Word. God in uh, communicating what He wants to the mind of man. That process is called? That's called revelation. And so He did this in various times, uh, in many times and in various ways. Hebrews chapter 1, 1 and 2. And then from the mind of man to the written Word, God said... Write down everything that I have, I have told you. So God wants it to be written down. And that's the process of inspiration. And obviously, if you had a dream, you cannot recover your dream. You know, when you wake up. And so through the process of inspiration, the, the uh, prophets can write down the dream or the vision or whatever things that God communicated with them. And then, of course, from the written word to the heart of the believer, the heart of the reader, that's the process of illumination. And so we all need this, you know, apart from illumination, no matter how good a preacher is, if the Holy Spirit is not working in the hearts of the believers, no, no lives can be changed. So the importance of anointing, not just on the part of the preacher, but more especially on the part of the people. And, uh, you know, I've heard preachers, you know, they're just almost like anemic. You know, it's mo monotone. And yet, the power was there. People were, were receiving the word. All right? And so, if the anointing is right there, you can pick up what the Spirit is saying, even through a preacher who might not have the, you know, the oratorical skills. And so, the importance of anointing, illumination. And so, this is what we call verbal, uh, plenary verbal inspiration. Plenary means all, and verbal means the very words. All the very words are inspired. And then we gave you the, uh, the flow chart, starts with hermeneutics, the principles for comprehending content. When we apply these principles to the Bible, it's already called exegesis, the task of comprehending content. And once you unearth the meaning and then communicate it, that's exposition. If you communicate it like tomorrow morning here at CCBC, I'll be preaching, uh, that would be homiletics. Or if it's inside the classroom like Sunday school, that would be pedagogy. And then, of course, the ultimate desire is to edify, all right, to build up. And the hermeneutics, we call this our recipe. Exegesis, we call this our actual baking. And then exposition is uh, bite-sized slices and then serving it to the people. So that's the picture that we, uh, we uh, painted to you yesterday. So we are done with the, uh, with the recipe. That's level one. Today is level two, exegesis, and Lord willing, next year, we'll try to regather for level three, and that would be expository preaching. So level one, hermeneutics, we uh, looked into this, and uh, it's like a ground, above the ground, those are the first six, the Bible as a human book, the first six rules, and then below the ground, the last four, the Bible as a divine book. So those are our personal convictions about the Bible. And so our recipe consists of 10 items. Number one, we need to understand God's word grammatically, understand it historically, culturally, contextually, literarily, and then logically. Six gears. And that's the Bible as a human book. But then, uh, the Bible is not only a human book, it's also a divine book. And so the last four, again, these are personal convictions about the Bible. We understand that God's word is inerrant, it is authoritative, it has unity, and it has mystery. No matter how many PhDs you've got, there will always be mysteries in the Bible. You know, we can never uh, fathom the depths of the infinite mind of God with our finite minds. And so there will always be questions. 
Right now, when I get to heaven, I'm, I'm going to make sure that I'm going to ask God, Lord, why did you make mosquitoes? You know, I don't understand why we need mosquitoes here on earth. And so again, we have these uh, questions you know, that we can uh, ask God things that we do not understand. All right. So today, we're looking at level two, and this is exegesis, the task of comprehending content. Again, uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Apollos Project, equipping the saints and expounding the scriptures. All right, praise the Lord for that uh, one person there who clapped his hand. <laughs> praise God. Now, there's a gap between the ancient text and the modern audience. This is a gaping hole. This is a big gap in terms of uh, time, chronology, in terms of geography in terms of culture a lot of things are different with the ancient text and the modern audience and so on the part of the reader and then the ancient text at least three biases already we learned this yesterday you have a personal bias your personal upbringing your educational level we have a cultural bias and then we are eastern mindset they are western mindset in uh, in america and then of course the theological bias the biggest circle of all that can uh, uh, bring a difference in the way we understand the Bible. But then on the part of the text, we have a chronological gap, we have geographical gap, we have cultural gap, we have language gap, we have literary gap, and then we have spiritual gap. So we need to find a way how to bridge these gaps, how to overcome these biases that we have. All right, so ancient text and the modern audience. How to bridge this gap? Different authors, different books make uh, an attempt how to bridge this gap. When I was taking my doctoral studies, our teacher, Dr. Wayne McDill, gave us a book, his book, the, that has 12 specific skills in bridging the gap between the ancient text and the modern audience. So we have to study these 12 specific steps or skills. He says, if you go from 1 to 12, then you'll be able to bridge the gap between the ancient text and the modern audience. So that's good. We had 12 right there. And then, in a seminary at APS, we had to read through the book of Haddon Robinson, standard reading for uh, preachers, for those who students of the word. His book presents 10 stages to bridge the gap between the ancient text and the modern audience. And so the 10 steps are right there. Again, outlined in his book, you go through these 10 steps, then you can bridge the gap between the ancient text and the modern audience. But then here comes another book, this one by David Dockery. Instead of 12, instead of 10, he said there are seven. Seven steps that you can bridge the gap between the ancient text and the modern audience. And you know, when I was preparing for my, uh, for my dissertation, uh, when I was, uh, I was doing a... Uh, dissertation on uh, expository preaching, I said, you know what, I need to find a way how to uh, bridge this gap in a way that Filipinos would be uh, easier for them to grasp. And so you've seen this picture in your manual and here in the PowerPoint, you've seen this preacher holding a Bible and then usually three points, all right? Three points right there, three fingers right there. <laughs> and so I said... You know, that's very big, biblical actually when you have three points. You know, the book of Revelation, the Lord Jesus Christ gave three points for the whole book as a summary, outlining the book of Revelation, three points. Now, I know, you know, different preachers, we have different styles. Others, you know, they don't have point one, point two. You know, their sermons are pointless. But no, no, no. I mean, they don't use point one, point two. Others, they have point one, point two. You know, different styles. That's okay. That's okay. But these three, I thought, at least there are three things that we need to go through in order to bridge the gap between the ancient text and the modern audience. So there in your notes, let's fill up those three uh, stages there. Number one, write down the words exegetical investigation. I'm sorry, that went uh, ahead very quickly. Exegetical investigation, write that down. So that's the first uh, stage that we want to go through. And here, in exegetical investigation, we're trying to answer the question. Let's read the question together. Everybody, ready, read. So, through this text, to the original recipients. So, that's the first task. 
A lot of times, Christians, they go straight, what can I learn from this passage? You know, they go immediately to application without going through interpretation. And so what happens sometimes is, as I've said yesterday, medyo from observation, direct to application, nagiging OA, you know, without the letter I in the middle. And so we need to find a way how to determine, at least from the words that he wrote here, guided by the Holy Spirit, what was his original plan to his original recipients. Number two, next uh, stage, we need to go through theological reflection. Write the, the, those two words down. Theological reflection. So this is the second phase. First phase, exegetical investigation. Second phase, theological reflection. All right? And then let's read together the question we want to answer in this uh, phase. Ready? Read. Alright, so after we discover the author's intention to his original recipients, now we bring that, well, how is it relevant to us today? To you personally as a preacher or teacher, and then to your congregation. So this is the second stage where we, we bring its relevance to us today. And then number three, for a third phase, write down the words homiletical presentation. Homiletical presentation. Homiletical presentation. Okay, let's read together the question we want to answer in this uh, phase. Ready, read. That will effect change. Now, that's very important, that will effect change. We're not here just to inform people. We're not here just to increase their knowledge. The purpose of God's word is to change lives. All right? If we're just passing down information, then, you know, we, we fall short of God's purpose for His Word. But then look at the words, best way. What is the best way? You know, different audiences will require a different way of communicating with them. Especially if you're dealing with Sunday school kids, you know? Sunday school kids, I mean, the attention span might be only 15 minutes. You can have them sit down for 15 minutes and after that they would be squirming and they want to stand and they want to run. And so you need to find a way how to, how to maintain their attention span through different activities. Now they say that adults, the attention span on average is only 15 minutes. Did they say for the kids 15 minutes? It should be less than. The adults is 15 minutes. That's the average attention span of adults. That means if you're preaching for 30 minutes, and then you preach in a monotonous way, you know, 15 minutes, the first 15 minutes, they're like that. The last 15 minutes, they're like that. And so you need to find a way how to extend their attention span. You know, the, the reason why I ask you to read is to extend your attention span. So some of you are there and you're sleepy already and then you hear people reading, oh, nagbabasa na, nagbabasa na, you know. And somehow it can extend your attention span. You know, this is why pastors would ask, would ask questions, Amen! They want you to respond just to extend your attention span. We need to find ways. We, we, you know, we, we tell jokes, not just for the sake of jokes. We want to extend your attention span. Alright? And so, uh, again, the best way to communicate. So, those three fingers right there, that's the heart and soul of the Apollos project. And so, this... These uh, teachers right here will be going to Tagaytay tomorrow afternoon. We'll be spending uh, three days together, two nights together. And then we want to make sure that this, this, uh, the, the heart and soul of the Apollos project will be passed on. We, we, we don't allow them to, uh, you know, to change these things. And so the first uh, phase is exegetical investigation. Second phase, theological reflection. The third phase is homiletical presentation. Now, this is where we are right now. We are on phase one. Next year, the Lord willing, on level three, we will handle theological reflection and homiletical presentation. How you prepare your sermon and then how to deliver your sermon uh, the most effective way, especially for Filipino context. Now, next page in your manual, you have there the preparation for exposition. No blanks there. But I just want to go through very quickly this uh, preparation for exposition. And again, we begin here with prayer. 
And this is where we anticipate God's direction. So letter P is praising God for who He is and what He has done in your life. You know, you just start with praising God. When your pastor assigns to you, oh, can you teach the Sunday school next Sunday? You know, you don't start, nakakainis naman si pastor, ako pa inassign. You know, you don't start by complaining. You start by praising God. I mean, it's, it's a privilege to preach God's word, to teach God's word. Because if you start by complaining, nakakainis talaga, eh, ako pa mag-aaral na ito. Ako pa mag-pre-preach ngayong Sunday. Nako. You know, again, the, the spirit is already different. You know, your mindset is already different. Letter R is repenting and asking God to forgive you of your sins. You know, you start with a clean slate. And it's so hard to preach when you know you're walking in sin, isn't it? But then, on second thought, I mean, you've heard of pastors, they've been in the ministry, they've been preaching, and yet at the same time, They've been having some affairs. And, uh, and that's the problem. That's the danger. That's the danger. And I shared with you yesterday, the pastor in the Middle East who was caught having an affair and uh, he justified his affair by saying, this is part of God's will, he said. Because if God did not allow David to have an affair with Bathsheba, we won't have Solomon today. You know, that kind of uh, justification. And so it's possible, but friends, we need to have a clean slate, and that's why we need to keep short accounts with God, because, you know, you get used to it. You know, it's like getting inside the theater. When you get inside the theater, you cannot see where you're going, but stay there for a while. Allow your eyes to be accustomed to the darkness, and then you can actually see where you're walking. You can actually see those who are kissing, you know? You can actually see people uh, inside the theater. And that's the problem with sin, isn't it? You can get used to it. You can be doing the ministry and at the same time actually walking in darkness. And that's always the issue. And that's why here, repenting and asking God, have a clean slate, keep short accounts with God. We all fall short, no problem with that. But then we need to ask God to use your time of study for His glory. Asking God to use your time of study for His glory. I mean, you don't pray, Lord, Gagalingan ko to tomorrow, Lord, para malaki ang love gift. You know? You, you, don't, you don't have that kind, of, uh, that kind of motivation so that I can have a, a, a greater applause tomorrow, so that I can have a, a bigger honorarium. You know, it's just all for the glory of God. And then letter Y is yielding your will to His in the spirit of humility and obedience. The first person that needs to be changed by your sermon is yourself. All right? And uh, again, you know, our congregation, they're very smart. I know some of them are glow, but you know, they're very smart. <laughs> because they can actually detect when the preacher is just preaching from the brain and not from the heart. They can, they're actually smart. They can detect if what you're saying is just your talk and not your walk. And you know what, friends, what happens? When the congregation begin to, when they begin to detect that there is that gap between your talk and your walk, that thin wire of respect snaps and you lose your congregation. Now, I'm not saying that you need to be 100%, you know, doing everything that you're saying, but you need to be honest with what you're saying. Don't challenge people, read your Bible every day. And you're not reading your Bible every day. I mean, tell them, friends, I know it's hard. I'm having struggle too. I'm having problem reading my Bible every night. But I tell you, commit yourself to it. You know, you're identifying with them. You're saying, I'm struggling too. But don't challenge them about something that you yourself, you know, you're not committed to doing it. And then letter E is entreating others who will benefit from your study. When I was still pastoring in Cebu, I live in the uh, Parsonage, the second floor of the church. And so Saturday, 9 o'clock in the evening, after the uh, worship team practice, the sanctuary will be empty. I would come down and you know, I would just pray there at the pulpit. Lord, I pray for the sermon tomorrow. I pray, Father God, Lord, that you will use 
every word that will come out of my mouth. And then I would actually go down and touch the chairs. You know, Lord, pray that these people will sit here. Lord, that these people here, Lord, that they will not be sleeping. You know, I mean, not you, but, you know, <laughs> but, uh, you know, you just commit your congregation to the Lord and uh, in treating others. And then finally, rejoicing in what God will, I'm sorry, rejoicing in what, uh, in what God will accomplish even before it happens. Friends, I mean, let's be honest about this. You cannot please everyone. You cannot please everyone. You know, yesterday, I came home, and I was, killing, I was feeling discouraged a little bit because I know that, you know, I stumbled on some of the parts yesterday. You know, I've been doing this seminar for, since 2005. In fact, Pastor Phil told me, why do you need to look at your laptop? And, you know, you've been doing this for hundreds of times. Well, of course, age is also catching up with me, and so I cannot remember everything. But sometimes your audience can intimidate you, isn't it? I mean, it was intimidating for me last uh, yesterday. I mean, to have you, I mean, these are distinguished men and women right here in front of me. I mean, uh, I feel like a lion in a, den of li uh, in a den of Daniels right here, you know? And so, an audience can intimidate you. And I was feeling discouraged because, you know, I could have done better. I could have done this. I could have said this. You know, again, friends, there will be things that will happen when you're preaching. You cannot please everyone. That's a fact. All right? There are things that you wish you said but you did not say. There are things that you did which you should not have done. Things will happen. But friends, just end with that. Rejoice in God will, what God will accomplish even before it happens. You know, just do your best for God and leave the rest to Him. All right? And so, praising or prayer, anticipating God's direction. And then, that would be uh, ascertaining. Exegetical investigation is actually we are ascertaining the author's intention. All right? So, we're trying to find out what he meant by what he wrote. But then secondly, theological reflection, we are now addressing the people's question. We are addressing the people's question. When you stand before the congregation, make sure that you already process things. You're already anticipating these are the possible issues that people are facing today. These are the possible problems people are trying to solve today so that you address the people's question when you preach. All right? So that's already part of your preparation for your sermon. And then, of course, homiletical presentation, you are now announcing the sermon's application. You see, Kiroso, the, the number one word used for preaching, it means to make a proclamation. That's when the, that's when the, uh, you know, the uh, one who would proclaim, he would be in the uh, center of the town, he would unfold the scroll, and he would say, hear ye, hear ye. Okay, here's the message from the king. That's the task of the preacher. We are there to make a proclamation. And that's why there's a, there's a difference in our, you know, in our demeanor when we teach. When you teach, you don't shout. You know, you're just teaching. But when you're preaching, oh, it involves your whole body. Your voice would go up. You'd go down. You can go fast. You can go slow. You're making a proclamation. All right? And so uh, we are announcing the, the sermon's application. And then finally, of course, the presentation of exposition, we are asking for the Spirit's anointing. And it all boils down to the Spirit's anointing. Okay? The anointing of the Holy Spirit. <laughs>